I set this back up if I take it out? Uh, you check with the AD guy. Okay. So I'm up next, and I'm going to use my own laptop as well. So okay. I'll have the problem. <laughs> it needs to be put back in again. All right. <laughs> what, uh, what are you speaking on? I'm doing transactions for microservices. Ah, there you I would really like to see that. I, uh, fortunately, I, I travel like, all the time on the solutions architect. All uh, right. And I made a completely rookie mistake and booked myself in two cities today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, so I am headed to London right after this. <laughs> I'm in a cab and going to the airport. <laughs> um, can, I, can I use this adapter or no? If I, yeah, can I use? Can I switch out the cables? Or is that a, is that not a good thing to do? Yeah, probably you. Okay. Well, I, I talk pretty loud. Well, just turn it on when you need it. And uh, if, if there are questions, make sure to repeat them so they get recorded. Gotcha. And so. So who's heard of reactive pro? Who's done reactive programming before? Anybody? Okay. One guy? Yeah. Okay. Sorry? Vertex, does that count? Vertex counts. Okay, yeah. In fact, I even have Vertex stickers. <laughs> All right, so is that on? Okay, is that on? Got a decent sound level back there? I'm pretty loud anyway, so I don't know if I... Yeah, so I, I have Vertex stickers for your laptop. If you need some, some stickers for your laptop here, we can pass these around when I come to the Vertex section. Because um, you want your laptop, you know, you get, we have a lot of stickers out front too. You plaster your laptop here. So one Vertex user, any other Vertex users, or Rx Java, or Rx JS, yeah. Okay. So while we're killing time, so so tell me why are we, we have five? We have like three minutes before we start. So why are you, why are you interested in this topic today? Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes to go. So why are you guys interested in this topic today? Using okay. Anybody else? Why are you, why are you interested in it? <laughs> All right, excellent. <laughs> Excuse me, I'll just cough for two minutes and that'll kill the thought until we start. And Sarah Jane, you want to come up here?
And you'll, you'll give me the thumbs up, right, when I'm ready to go. Oh, we're ready to go? You want us to go ahead and start? Oh, I'm sorry. You give me that. All right, sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the session. This is called Get Reactive Programming Systems Microservices. Uh, speaker is Jeremy Davis, Red Hat. And uh, Jeremy Davis is a principal solution architect for AppDev. Before joining Red Hat, he wrote a lot of code in JavaScript, Perl, Visual Basic, Ruby, Python, C, C Sharp, Objective C, and of course, Java. He currently co leads Red Hat's microservices community of practice. Welcome. Thank you. All right, thank you for joining my talk about Reactive. I've given this talk or a variation on this talk a number of times. It usually runs longer than 35 minutes, so I'm going to go really quick. But feel free to interrupt, all right? I, actually, I love it when people interrupt. And I have stickers. I'll give you a sticker early if you interrupt me and ask questions, right? So audience participation is highly encouraged. Do you want a time mark? So yeah. Point? Please. Like five more minutes? Or Give me like 10 minutes. 10, 10 minutes in, we'll make sure we're going through stuff. Um, so, it, so you just got a, a good bit of my background uh, here. Uh, I started out as a, as a dot-com web monkey. That's when I began my career all on front end. I'm doing a lot of JavaScript. This is the last time I was at Boston University. Uh, my father was a professor here, and uh, that was probably the last time I was on ice skates because after we left Boston, went to South Carolina, where you don't get a lot of opportunity to get on ice skates, right? Um, but I, I have I've skated at the Boston University ice rink uh, a decade or three or so ago. <laughs> Right. Um, so we're going to start off, and you guys will have, I, I really wanted you guys to have my uh, email address and, and Twitter handle too, so these will be available. I'll put them out on SlideShare, so I assume they'll be available from the conference as well. So um, we're going to start, first of all, of why this matters, right? So a couple people said they're already using some reactive toolkits uh, or interested in the topic, have heard of it. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a different angle. I think that user experience is why reactive matters. Now, this guy's a user experience guru, uh, but I have colleagues who are user experience gurus as well. And so I asked Sarah Jane, who you can find out here, uh, to sort of to kick us off talking about what Red Hat does around UX. Sure. Um, my name is Sarah Jane Clark, and I'm on Red Hat's user experience design team. I am the lead uh, user experience researcher on developer focused products, which is why we're here today. And what we're doing in our booth out here are actual usability tests. So we have um, four products that we're looking at. Um, including uh, Patternfly, which is our design system, uh, OpenShift IO, OpenShift, and um, the new developer website. And what we're trying to do is get feedback, because that feedback is what helps the designers know how to design the products. So um, it's super important for us to understand what's important to you, uh, what isn't important to you, um, and what you think about, about our products. So that's the feedback we're getting. We have all kinds of goodies. So if you have five minutes for me, I would love to hear your feedback. Thank you. And so who writes front end code? A couple people. Who writes back end code? Everybody, right? Everybody. Everybody. So now we'll go to the, and normally when we talk about user experience, we talk about the front end, right? That's what we think about in terms of layout and design and navigation. Um, but this guy, and, and this guy early on, Jacob Nielsen, uh, I, I mentioned I started as a dot-com web monkey, right? And this guy was like the guru at the turn of the century. This guy was the guru around web design, which was kind of amusing because the guy's website was completely boring. Like it was just text. Um, but, he, but he was the guru, right? Um, but he has these three numbers, and he started his career at, I, th I think, IBM and his career doing mainframe usability. I know that's kind of an oxymoron, right? But he did mainframe usability, and then he did, at Sun Microsystems, did like fat client stuff, and then moved on to the web when the web was taking off, and now does mobile and web consultancy. And he has these three numbers, 0.1, 1, and 10. And this is all relates to uh, how you feel something is responding. In 0.1 second, you feel like you're interacting actively with your application, whether it's a website or whether it's moving your mouse around or, or using your clicky or whatever it is. At one second, you begin to notice a lag. So if I were to click this and it took a second for that slide to change, or if I click a button on a web page and it takes a second, you begin to notice a lag, but it's okay. At about 10 seconds, you're going to abandon what you're doing. And this is why you get you know, the spinning beach ball of death on a Mac or why you get you know, icons on a website that tells you something's happening, right? Because it's giving you feedback saying, you know, hang on, wait. 
And the th- interesting thing about this is these numbers, uh, he, I mentioned he started off doing mainframe, uh, did fat client stuff, did web, mobile. These numbers have stayed the same across all those paradigms. So there's something that's uniquely human about these numbers, right? And if we write back-end code, we have to deal with this because we have to get a response to our users inside of these time frames. And reactive is responsive. And so that's why we started with user experience and, and being able to deliver, right? There are also interesting, fun tools, and we're going to look at several of these tools. Uh, I, I'm assuming that most people have heard of at least Node.js. Some of these others are probably going to be new. Um, Vertex is a Red Hat project. I, I have Vertex stickers up here, and we've got some, some Vertex stickers out there as well. Um, and we'll, we'll take a dive into Vertex, um, Akka, and, and React, actually four technologies. Four technologies in 35 minutes, or 30 minutes. All right, so we're covering really three topics, um, but the two big ones are reactive systems and reactive programming, and then we'll talk about how those feed into microservices architecture, where they make a lot of sense. And we're going to do uh, both programming and systems, right? So this programming might look a little weird. Hopefully, it won't look too weird in just a few minutes. Um, and this is this is about reactive systems. This comes from the Reactive Manifesto, which is a manifesto, and you can all go sign that right after this, right? I'm a proud signatory of the Reactive Manifesto uh, as well, as well as the Vertex team. The Vertex team guys have all signed that. All right, so is, everybody in here is a programmer or writes code, right? Okay, excellent. So traditional programming, right, imperative programming, what you normally do, the way we write code is we call a method, we get the output from that method, stored in a variable, and then we do something useful with that variable. Right? Useful method, I know, it's, it's just, it had to fit on my slide, right? Um, and then we call this compute method, right, and we store it in this variable, and then we do something useful. In this case, we put it out to the console, right? But this is how programming works, right? It's how we've done programming for a long time, unless you've done, like, front-end co- uh, code, right? I bench I started out as a web monkey doing a lot of kind of user experience, user uh, interface stuff. Well, same as if you've done fat client user interface stuff. So asynchronous programming is a little bit different, right? We do we do callbacks. So instead of the notion of uh, calling um, calling a function and storing that result, we create a method that does something useful, and then we define an asynchronous call to this method, and then we do some other stuff until it comes back. And what that looks like is we have this compute method, again, like really interesting, but we've added one thing here. We've added a callback that's getting passed in. And if you've used JavaScript or Ruby, um, you know, you can think about these as, as closures, right? Um, it, it, a lambda here in the Java world, right? So when we call this method, instead of getting this back and storing the result and doing something that, with the result that comes back, we pass in our values and we pass in the function to tell it what to do. Right, so we're passing in this handler, and it just calls handle. And this is, a, this is a vertex construct, async handler. But the notion is we're passing in a piece of code that's going to do something, and the code will get executed from inside of that method. But it's not going to block. It's not going to make anybody wait for this to happen. That's very efficient, but callbacks can kind of lead to stuff that looks like this, right? And there would actually be more code inside of here, right? Because we, we have failure handling code. And we can end up with these really big nested callbacks, right? And this is usually uh, referred to as callback hell. And this can be kind of difficult to navigate, right? And it, can get, can, it can get tough to read. And that's, you know, your IDE has those little switches on the side, right? And you can collapse your code and try to figure out where your, your bracket, what bracket's missing, right? So when we get to reactive programming, the rest of the stuff that we're going to talk about is largely ways to deal with or make this easier. So it also kind of feeds into user experience for us as developers. And we don't usually think about user experience in that way, but if you're writing a library that somebody else is going to use, you have a user that will have an experience, right? And we don't usually think about usability in that way, um, but it becomes really important. And as developers, we all like the things that make our lives easier, and we like nice, clean APIs, right? So I'm now going to stop talking for a while and actually look at some code, right? Because you guys want to see code, right? More than you want to see uh, more than you want to see my slides, right? All right. So if you guys can see this, this is um, we're going to build a little bit of, of RX Java, right? So we'll get into what ReactiveX and where it comes from. But I mentioned that this is about uh, building APIs around those kind of callbacks and asynchronous programming to make it easier for, for you to do that. And what we have here, you can see, is this thing called an observable. And we're subscribing to this observable. 
And right here we've just got a, a, a list of strings, right? And if we run this, it doesn't do anything really cool. It just spits out the array, right? And then no big deal. So that's, that's the first introduction to reactive programming, is, is it, uh, it spits out strings. But the next thing we're going to do here is we're, we're going to take the same method and we're going to add some stuff here. And it's going to change what we do. Whoops, did I run the same one? Ah. So now I split the words out so it's not one object. Now we're going to add some other stuff. I'm going to treat this as an iterable. So I'm not going to have to do the traditional way of iterating over something, right? I'm going to use this um, from iterable, and then I'm going to do something called zip with. Whoops, I missed one first. Let me do something boring first again. I'm going to say observable, and I'm going to do a range. And I'm going to pass in some numbers, and I'm going to spit out the numbers 1 through 5. Again, like that's not real interesting, right? We just spit out 1 through 5. It gets interesting when we get to this one, because now I've got two observables here, and one of them is doing that range thing, right? So this is going to this is going to create numbers and just return a number, and then I'm passing in my lambda here, and I'm telling it to to spit out the number and the word, and I'm using this zip with thing here. So zip with is going to take these two streams of data and concatenate those streams of data for me. So now I've got this, right? And not a lot of code that I have to write to do that. So now we'll, uh, we'll do something a little more interesting. We'll split this out. Because now we're going to start doing some, some data analysis, right? We're going to write a real programming. So we have the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, right? And they, they always tell you when you start typing, right? This, this is every letter in the alphabet. So I want to find out if it is every letter in the alphabet. Um, which, by the way, this example was not. This was not my idea. Um, this was another guy's example who I, can't, I could not find his uh, his post again. It's on D Zone though, so um, unknown guy. I have to give you a lot of credit because this is this was a great way of, uh, of explaining this. So now we've got 36 different letters, but that's not really so useful, is it? Because we want to find out exactly which ones we have. So now we're going to split our words up, and we're going to call a modifier called distinct, and we're going to add that in the mix. And that's going to show me that I have 25 different letters. The quick brown fox jumped over the lady, lady dog, which is one shy of the alphabet, right? Or the English alphabet. So now let's, th let's throw in another one called sorted. So now we can see what we're missing. Where are we missing? We're missing an S, right? So we can come down here. It's very quickly. So live data analysis, right? Uh, yeah. What does subscribe do? Does it care if it's dealing with float or a char? I, I will. I will get to that in just a second. Um, I, I will explain this in, in real, in real actual detail. So observable stuff. When we do, when we do all this stuff, we can go from. I'm still going to give you a sticker because thank you for the question interrupting me. And I, and I promise I am going to answer that. And make sure to repeat the question. Now. I will re I will repeat that because the question was, what does subscribe do? What is subscribe? And we will jump into what subscribe is. So we can go from simply having an array to sorting and sorting, you know, uh, taking two streams of data, concatenating that data into something that we can use, right? And this is what Rx is about, reactive extensions. Now let's go back to my slides here and we'll explain kind of what I was... Uh, what we were just looking at. So I mentioned that, that asynchronous programming is different from imperative programming, right? Because we create our method that does something useful, we define an asynchronous call, and then we do other stuff until that call returns. Well, that's what we were doing there, but we used some constructs on top of it that, that kept us from getting in that kind of callback syntax. And what we did is we created a method that calls something useful. Um, we defined the asynchronous call, and that observable object was how we defined that asynchronous call. Then we attached an observer to the observable by calling subscribe. And so when we call subscribe, we say, okay, I'm watching you. And this is a, an important construct in the Rx world. Until you attach a subscriber, it's not going to do anything. It's just a method. It's never going to get executed. Subscribe means like, okay, actually do stuff. It has to be observed. It has to be observed for it to execute anything. 
Now, there are subclasses of, of observable. I'm going really quick, so I'm not going to get into all of them. Um, in RxJava 2, there's a couple of things, flowable, uh, completable, um, that have uh, different use cases, but there's, there's subtypes of observable. And then the other big piece is, so one, we, we, we have this method that does something useful that we observe, right, and we call observe on it. And the other piece are all of these modifiers that we saw, right, grouped by flat map. Flat map means we're going to be pulling in multiple pieces of data and concatenating them into one thing that's useful. So in the real world, what's a real world use for this kind of, uh, it's, it's also, it's like, remember the gang of four observer pattern, right? It's, it's kind of a lot like that, right? Um, we've got some extra methods on here, right? So on completed and on error are uh, key pieces of it. They're very cardinal parts of this because we know that errors are going to happen and we know we want to deal with it. So a real world use case, and uh, at the end of the slides I have some links. Ben Christensen is a guy at Netflix who talks really well, and he implemented the ReactiveX Java library, or was one of the guys that did. Has some great talks on, on YouTube. Um, this is built using uh, RxJava. And the reason for that is at one point in time when Netflix first began uh, you know, exploding, um, they kept adding functionality into their homepage. And I, I believe the number was 38. So at one point in time, they had to make 38 synchronous calls to display your homepage when you log in. Right? Which you know what that, how that's going to get back to those numbers we started off talking about. Right? You're not going to get that homepage up in, in a second when you're making 38 blocking calls. Right? And so they knew they had to do something else. And he, be, he began looking at reactive extensions and implemented the reactive extensions for Java. Another little aside here that's interesting, I, I, meant that, you know, I mentioned that on error, errors are treated as first class citizens. And this paradigm forces you to deal with that and have backup plans. And uh, one of the things they do at Netflix is they, there are some of these recommendations that are cached. Right? So this is, I logged in, this is uh, top picks for dad, um, you know, continue watching for dad. And I can guarantee you the top picks for dad do not include uh, Lab Rats and uh, uh, Total ID Drama or whatever these shows are. So either a reactive call failed and they grabbed some cache data, or maybe my kids had logged in and watched things under my account. You know, it's possible also. But for the sake of this talk, I like to go with the first, right? I think it, 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 uh, it, it illustrates the point better. It's more likely the latter. Right, it's more, <laughs> more likely the latter. All right, so ReactiveX. ReactiveX started uh, life at Microsoft in the .NET world. It was, this was originally a C-sharp thing, but it has gained a lot of life. Here, let's look at ReactiveX here. One thing that's really nice, there's a couple of things that are really nice about ReactiveX. One thing that's really nice is... Ah, <laughs> that's really nice. One thing is, <laughs> let's get back on my phone. Um, <laughs> and, uh, oh, okay. Um, on uh, on choose your platform. Um, there's there's reactive. There's an RX implementation in just about any language that you want to use. Um, and and if there's not one, you can send them some pull requests, right? Because they have a. Uh, they have more implementations. So there's a lot of languages in here. Some more complete than others, but there's a lot. And the documentation is really nice, especially for you know, open source community projects. This is really nice wow. documentation. And you can really come through here um, and, and, and figure out how, how these pieces work. And you'll get used to playing with marbles, right? This is when people, people started calling these diagrams. These are these operator diagrams. People started calling them marbles. It's like we, we saw a flat map, right? So if we go to flat map, there's a flat map, and this is showing us what happens. I'm pulling in different types of data. Like I'm pulling in these three types of data, and what that's going to do behind the scenes is transform it all into the same thing and give me one stream out. Right? So I can have red, green, and blue, and what I get out are all identical objects, right? all zipped together, or mapped together. And in the spirit of marbles, you can go to rxmarbles.com, and here's a JavaScript implementation of this. And you can play with marbles, and it will show you, you'll see exactly how that affects the output you get. And you can go like from, you can go interval, default empty, debounces, what, what a debounce does. And this is a debounce of time, so you notice like you won't actually get a result there if you, if you come within a certain interval. So you can play with these marbles, which does help when you begin uh, when you begin programming in this in this uh, using RX, because um, there is a bit of a learning curve, right? So it's, this is a shift, a different way of thinking. All right, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna start going maybe even a little bit faster. So operators playing with marbles. These links are also all in the back, right? So ReactiveX are, are a series of extensions, lots of different languages designed to, to let you build reactive code really easily. Now you can build reactive systems using this. Netflix did that, right? They run on Tomcat on AWS, right? Everybody's heard about Netflix microservices architecture. Um, don't mutate your state outside the function, by the way. You only want to change things inside of those functions. Um, but there are, there are other toolkits to make building complete reactive systems easier, right? So reactive programming is one way of doing it, and you can build a system that way, but there are also toolkits to make systems easier. Now, I mentioned this is the reactive manifesto. This is a manifesto that you can go and sign. Um, you know, right after this talk, you're going to completely believe this, and you're going to want to come sign the manifesto, right? So you go to reactivemanifesto.org. The ideas behind this starts with responsiveness, right? So at the top of this diagram, the key to building these applications is responsiveness. Came out of uh, some guys in Europe who had been doing work on really large systems inside of banks, or large systems for banks, and they came up with this way that this is how we need to build applications to make them responsive and to scale, right? So key number one is that everything needs to be responsive. People get bored, they, they want an answer, right? And that doesn't matter, that, that's your end user who's interacting with the user interface, as well as other people working with your library, right? We need an answer back. In order to do this, your system has to be resilient, right? So it has to be self-healing. Um, we need to be able to replicate the components of your system, right? So like statelessness, a lot of the kind of concepts we hear when we talk about cloud native development, a lot of things we hear about like in the world of microservices. Um, any kind of failures need to be contained, right? So it needs to happen inside of there, but doesn't ha should not propagate out into the entire system, right? So if one piece fails, that's okay. We have a strategy for dealing with that, right? And that was the key thing about Netflix, right? If one of these 38 calls fails, that's okay. You still get the home screen. They also need to be able to be elastic, so they have to scale up and scale back down, right? Um, because we know, one of the things we know in systems today is we can't necessarily tell how much data we're going to get, right? We, we had these, we started off with, the, with lazy dog, right? But then we started adding other things in there. We started adding a, another stream of data in there with numbers. In systems today, we don't necessarily know how many other systems we have to call, how many other sources of data we have, right? Especially as we move to like a microservices architecture and the business realizes they can get a new feature into production in a week or two, you're going to be dealing with a lot of new sources of data, new sources of truth, right? And then the other key here that they came up with is that your system should be message driven. And the next few things we look at will implement this in different ways. Vertex uses JSON for this, right? So JSON is the payload for, for passing uh, messages between objects. The first thing we'll look at, though, is Akka. And that's because this was written by the Akka guys. They were really leaders in this space, or the Lightbend guys. If you guys are familiar with Lightbend, right? The guys that are, uh, do Scala. <coughs> All right, so our first toolkit, I mentioned we'll look at these three things next, Akka, Vertex, and then Spring Reactor. Um, Akka is called a toolkit for highly resilient, scalable applications. I'm going to give you one disclaimer here. So I first saw Akka at a conference very similar to this, sat down and watched this talk on Akka. My immediate impression was, wow, I never want to build an application using that. Um, then when I began doing some research for this talk, I, I started playing with Akka, and you know what? Akka is pretty cool. Um, so the moral of that story is, you know, even if the guy up front doesn't do a good job about talking to the technology, go get your hands dirty, right? That's why we're looking at code. You know, uh, I, I might not convince you that this is good stuff, but uh, you can change your mind by, go, by, you know, downloading this and firing up. This is all open source. You know, you can get going really easy. And there's a, there are nice tutorial on, tutorials on Akka's website. Um, so... The way that Akka works is it uses the actor model, and actors talk to other actors by sending messages to other actors' mailboxes. We don't, we don't pass anything by reference. Everything gets passed completely in a message, right? That message gets received, some sort of action gets taken, and then another message gets sent somewhere else. They're completely, there's no state, right? Everything happens within the own actor, which gets us back to how do we scale? How, you know, how, do we ha how, how are we resilient, right? We can spin up more and more actors. You know, they can be in different, different uh, data centers. They can be across you know, different machines. Um, so it becomes e very easy to scale. It's also very easy to bring those back in. Um, there is one sort of parent that makes this map under the covers of all the actors in the system, and it uses URLs to talk to them, right? So a layer of indirection, which means this URL could point to multiple different different things, right? We could we can scale out behind these internal URLs. You don't have to manage this Akka itself as the framework does that for you. What it looks like is 
my next IntelliJ thing. So the way that the, that Aqua works, is it, does anybody use Scala? Anybody a Scala fan? A couple of Scala fans? Okay, so I don't know Scala. One of my good, one of my buddies at work and, and uh, colleagues uh, likes Scala a lot, and so he says this, 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 the way that uh, Aqua is written, he thinks is very intuitive, coming from a Scala mindset or a Scala-based approach. Um, it's it's not hard to get to in Java either, because um, I, I did the Java examples, right? So I don't know Scala. But if, this is just a little hello world example. It's pretty simple. Um, and we have these things, these actor references, right? We have a printer actor and we have a howdy actor. And what these classes do is that this is a class called, it has a class called greeting, right? And it just takes this class, it receives a class, and you use the class type to let it know what to do. So like this takes a receive uh, a who to greet class. So instead of just passing a message to, or calling a method, you use the object type to send in these messages. Here for 10 minute mark. 10 minute mark, okay, I'm gonna go okay, really quick. Uh, let me fire up, let me debug this uh, test, we'll stop. Oh great, I typed an error, okay. Um, anyway, that is the basic ACA Example. The thing to remember about Akka is all message based and it handles behind the scenes this abstraction and, and it makes it really easy for you to scale up and scale down. It's also pretty easy to get going with and pretty, and pretty quick. All right, Spring Web Flux. So Spring, Spring Web plus Reactor. Um, Spring Web, uh, you've probably built a website. If you're in the Java space, you've probably built a website using Spring MVC before. Um, Spring Web is, you know, obviously they're, they're a web uh, toolkit. Uh, they jumped into the reactive space a few years ago. They said they were going to make uh, the user interface a lot easier to use. Um, I don't think they really got there. They ended up changing some of the names. So instead of a single, they have a mono. And instead of a flowable, they have a flux. Um, other than that, it's almost exactly like Rx Java. Um, so it's basically the same thing. It's mostly built into um, the regular Spring website. So instead of, uh, so you would just get back a client response of an observable type. Um, but you would uh, otherwise it's very similar to the way you would do traditional spring programming. All right, now I'm going to go to Eclipse Vertex, right? So uh, my Vertex stickers are up here. In fact, you will pass around Vertex stick. I'm going to save one for the one for the. You, know, you asked me a question, so I'm going to make sure you get a sticker. Everybody else, you got to hand your stickers back, grab some stickers, and there's more up front if you guys want some of these. Um, so Vertex is based on a single threaded event loop. So does it sound like Node.js? That's because it was inspired by Node.js. Uh, the guy that wrote this um, wrote uh, Hornet Q, which was the, the JMS message broker inside of, J, of JBoss EAP, or, or JBoss application server. Um, it was the world's fastest JMS message broker. It was based heavily on something called Netty. Um, Netty will pop up a lot. This is also inside of Spring Web Flux. You'll see it in a lot of the reactive space. It's a super, super fast, low-level IO network. If you've ever used Twitter or done anything from uh, with Apple, you've used Netty. It's, it forms the basis of the iTunes and your, your app store. Um, but being a message-based guy, um, when he created Vertex, he took the concept of a single-threaded event loop to build websites and married onto it an event bus, right? Not surprising from a guy that, that wrote event buses, right? Or wrote message brokers. Um, now, this isn't like the kind of thing we have to stand up persistence. I think it's very simple. In, the, in a Vertex world, everything is what we call a vertical. And a vertical can... can it has its own own event bus. You can you can pass messages off the event bus and and pass uh, your uh, compute over to a different vertical. I've got a app running right now, and this is a public example. And this uh, I've got this ex this example. You can get a link to this. One thing about Vertex, it's super lightweight. This is actually currently pretty heavy. Um, it's using 275 megs, but I'm running nine instances and a database here. So all that memory is nine instances of Vertex. The code for this, this is a, a stock trading application. It's not real, completely fake uh, stock trading application. Um, but we are sending trades. The way this stuff ends up looking in a Vertex world So Vertex has a number of different ways to help you get through callbacks. One, you can do callbacks, right? This is kind of traditional looking way to do callbacks. So we, we have a request stream, right? And we're returning a flowable, right? Which is an observable subtype. And then we're subscribing to that here, right? So a lot of the Rx pieces are built right into Vertex to make it very easy for you to use those kind of concepts.
And then RX Java concepts like singles are built right in, so you can use these. And you can chain together calls. So we can call multiple different services. So we can like call shares. We can get the price of a share. We can find out if there are any orders. We can grab those and zip those together. And we can do this really easily, right? So when you think about it, especially in a microservices world where you're calling multiple different services like the Netflix front end, if you're calling you know, a couple dozen services, this makes it really easy to chain those together and perform your operations right there inside of your microservice or inside of your service. Um, service, and then... Five minutes, and then the other piece about Vertex also heavily message based. So when we send when we send messages across our, our event bus, we use JSON. JSON is a is a first class citizen inside of Vertex, and all messages it's recommended. You don't have to do this, but it's recommended that all your messages get passed as JSON, which is nice because it's language agnostic. You can attach and you can attach to the event bus directly from like your web browser using JavaScript, right? So you can send a, you can send a JSON message to the event bus. You can read from the event bus, and that's actually how we are getting in this example how we're getting these numbers, right? We're not, we're talking natively from JavaScript right to this Vertex event bus. And we're using JSON for our message payloads, which is key, right? Because you want to be, you want to send message, you want to pass messages, and we don't want to pass something by reference, right? We're passing something by value, in this case, JSON text. <laughs> JSON objects, right? So JSON objects become uh, really what you, what you work with. Another another thing I didn't mention, Vertex is polyglot. If you don't like Java, there are JavaScript, uh, Ruby, um, other implementations, and this team has done has done a lot of work to make it feel native. So if you're using the if you're using the JavaScript or the Ruby one, it actually feels like you're using Java or uh, JavaScript or Ruby. But it doesn't feel grafted in like a lot of say JRuby or or other things. Um, links in here. Um, this, pro, this book I highly recommend, great book written by uh, Ben Christensen and Thomas Nurkowitz. Um, they're the guys that wrote RX Java. Um, ben Christensen also has some really good talks that you can watch on, uh, at the, uh, this link is hot, um, go to 2013. Um, on, on YouTube. Akka, I mentioned these, this is the guys from Lightbend. This book is pretty good, and these, were, these guys really waved, you know, were banner carriers for, for the reactive movement. And uh, Jonas Bonaire, um, who is the CEO, I guess, of, or CTO, um, he, he has a number of good talks on, on, on this topic as well. Um, Spring Web Flux, um, and, and they have a lot more, I think, to put these slides together. Um, they're starting to talk about this a lot more in the spring world. Um, Vertex, you can download both of these books from developers.redhat.com. Those are both free. Um, really nice. I love the title, A Gentle Guide to Asynchronous Programming. Right? Um, there's also lots of different tutorials, including the one that I was just showing here, this, this trader vertical um, that, I was, that I'm running uh, currently on OpenShift, which is our, our Kubernetes distro on my laptop. You don't have to run it on Kubernetes. You can just spin it up on your laptop, too. All right, thank you very much. Did I pull that off in 35? Three minutes, Three minutes. Anybody have questions? <coughs> Was that too fast? Yeah, yeah. How does it compare with Node.js? So how does Vertex compare to it? Um, so yeah. Reactive in general, so Node uses that callback model, right? So, you know, when a web request comes in to, to an endpoint being serviced by Node, it grabs that request and then sends the work off to another thread and then continues listening, right? And Vertex works very much the same way. And that's an, a reactive method of programming. Because you think about the way we would do things with servlets or traditional HTTP calls, right? You know, if, if, you're, if you're programming a Java servlet, Call comes in, Java servlet connects to a database or, or you know, grabs a database connection from somewhere, performs a query, gets the query back, unmarshals it, turns it into an object, decorates it with some other stuff, and then sends the call back. Right? Um, which is fundamentally different than like a Vertex event loop or, or very similar in a Node.js world. Call comes in, Vertex sends something to the event bus, which uh, contains a handler saying what to do when it comes back. Right? So when yeah. you say callbacks, does it mean uh same as what we call as promises? So the question was, are callbacks the same as promises? Uh, no, they're not the same as promises. There's another piece too. There's a future that's a Vertex future that's different from a Java future. A Java future blocks. A Vertex future does not block at all. Um, and so in the Vertex world, we use Vertex futures. Promises are... Oops. So callbacks don't have to be any particular kind of object, right? It's just a piece of code, largely. 
Whereas a promise is going to return something in the future, but it's a construct on top of that. And the notion about the callbacks are the lowest level, the lowest, easiest way of doing that. And you still use it. It's fine to use them, right? It's just you don't want to end up with too many nested callbacks when it becomes problematic. Right? They're not the same. Not quite the same. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? That's about what we have to All right, thanks, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. All right.